we got a lot of uh, requests if we can do a series on getting started with embed systems and this is going to be one of uh, the first videos in the playlist in this series of playlist we are going to focus on embed system and specifically we'll work on embed system design based on cortex m devices we'll take uh, one of the cortex m based devices which is stm and we'll uh, we'll try to program it when we'll see how to program different peripherals around it how to boot a stm based device how to boot an arm cortex m device and learnings from this can be taken to any cortex m based device you no matter if it is coming from microchip ti etc you can take the same learnings you can understand and you can get working on it well uh, and i'll just maybe extend that the reason we have chosen the m class device is because well it's very popular that is number one and second pretty much all of the learnings that you can have because of that cpu can be ported over to other cpus with a yes. you know, few changes here and there yeah plus it's cheap and easily available in the market yes also that <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so we are going to take a much more practical approach and we will time to time go into ids program and uh, see the outputs on on the way, uh, see the waves on the oscilloscopes and, right but i would like to uh, you know shout out one thing that you may not uh, you don't necessarily need a stm32 f4 to follow the curriculum you can follow majority of the curriculum we will share some of the codes and uh, that you can run on vnode right and so to some and of what the people who don't know vnode yeah. vnode is a emulation platform that can be used to emulate uh, any device it contains a lot of devices uh, it has its uh, emulation model for stm32 f4 discovery which we are going to use for our experiments uh we have gone into the details of renode in one other video maybe we can add, uh, share the link in the description yeah we'll add that. that in the description yes so, okay so, i suppose with that then do you want yeah. to jump into what we see on the screen here yeah so before we look into this screen the simple agenda is you know what is the system what do we call hmm. a system in my view a system is something a black it's like a black box that takes some input from the user and gives you some output okay and user doesn't need to take care of or doesn't need to understand in most cases what the internal system is it's based on interfaces now this system can be built from anything right it can be purely electronic it can be purely mechanical it can be a combination of mechanical and electrical like your engines right and embedded systems are are nothing different what embedded system means is you give an input to a system and this system is categorized to be formed of some kind of hardware which is controlled by some kind of software fair that takes some input processes it and gives you some kind of output right uh so how these typical systems are designed now uh, one of the constraints that we have uh not specific constraints there are certain systems that can understand a bit of analog but and but most of the processing elements that we have out there are based on digital components digital is nothing but an abstraction on analog but still it makes things easy to design mm -hmm. so but so most of our com processing components only understand digital but most of our world is analog actually there is nothing called digital everything is analog so when I, so we have a input right. but our embedded system doesn't understand it so we need some kind of some kind of uh, components that can transpose or transform these kind of signals into something the system can understand and that's why in majority right. of the embedded systems you will see adcs on the input which convert a analog signal into a digital signal that processors can understand and on the outputs you see a digital to analog converter which takes the digital output from the processors and convert into analog that the real world can understand okay so maybe let me just connect the dots because i suppose you know i just want to call out what the input and output was so we were referring to the system internals as this much right and then yes. the inputs are coming from here and the outputs are going out from here and what you mentioned was that the user need not know what's inside here and now we are peeling the onion and saying you somewhere mentioned 
that the processor will only understand digital things, meaning zeros and ones, right? And it yeah. will output zeros and ones, but the real world is not like that. And yes. then somewhere you mentioned that there would be this, you know, these three components, but maybe you didn't talk about these two, but you mentioned analog to digital conversion so that you can feed in digital data and then output is again zeros ones and DAC will convert it back to analog. Right? Yep. Okay, go ahead. So, Rajiv, okay. can you give a small, uh, you know, a real life example so that we can understand this complete pipeline? Sure, let's go to the next slide for the example. Oh, sure. But uh, oh, can, you, you know, I, I have an example. Can I, can I jump in, Rajat? So a yes. thermometer, for example, yes. a digital thermometer, this would be the temperature sensor, which senses in analog. This amplifies that signal. This converts that signals to zeros and ones, like numbers. This processes it. Uh, I don't know what processing like thermometer would specifically do, but let's say it does <laughs> for purpose of displaying it on the screen, let's say. Then it puts it back into... <clears throat> well, the, the, the thermometer would kind of just stop here. It would output on like a digital screen, right? Uh, but for whatever reason, let's say you wanted to turn uh, the AC on, then that goes as a some sort of a signal to the DAC. DAC amplifies it, turns on some sort of a motor that let's say, you know, turns the flap uh, of the AC and then lets the air come in. Like just random example. Go, go ahead, Rajit. Yeah. So for you, uh, let's take one of the popular devices out there, Alexa, and you can think of it, right? So you have multiple places to do the input. You can either input via touch screen, your audio is uh, an input. So I'm going to take the example of audio, where if you look at an audio, audio is nothing but a complete analog signal. So there's a microphone in the Alexa, Alex, uh, that microphone transmits that signal internally. Uh, to the processor, the processor amplifies it using the amplifier, uh, gives it to a ADC or a pulse coordinate modulation and going to take that uh, and transfer it to, into a digital signal that it can process. And then it does all kind of processing or it uh, detects the hot word. It may even talk to the server to uh, find out uh, what the, uh, found out what the user want, etc. And basically comes up a decision what the user want. Let's say I wanted to play a music. And finally, it gets what music I want to play. And now it has the digital form of that music wave file downloaded within it. And it's going to now transfer it into a codec, which is nothing but basically a DAC. And that DAC uh, transfers it to your aux signals, where you can now listen the music or to your or, uh, uh, speakers. Right. But is this convincing you? Dave? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Then moving on. So, you know, uh, one of the reasons that like, I would say from the thing, okay, like I, I'm born in 94s. So okay. I don't know. There was not much electronics out there and maybe Piyush and Dave will agree. Yeah. Okay. Even get, a TV in every home was yeah. rare, right? At but nowadays we see so much. Nowadays we see so much electronics yeah. around us. Uh, even a single person right now, like right now sitting, I'm using uh, at least nine electronic devices around me. Right. My microphone, my headphones, my monitor, my yeah. laptop, my keyboard, my yeah. mouse. There's so much electronics around it. And But how, can, how did we improve so mm. much? And the credit of it all goes to, uh, you know, the uh, manufacturing technology that has improved over the years. Right. And specifically, uh, so Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel, yeah, somewhere in 1960s uh, predicted uh, people call it a law but it was just a saying and prediction that he did and it became a law where he said that every second year we are just going to increase the number of transistors on a single dial right no technical reason nothing he just predicted that's the way uh, that's the only way we can grow if we increase the number of transistors every second year and that's what came to became a moore's law mm -hmm. and Intel, as we all know, it was a manufacturing company. It started and that's where uh, this law came from. So, and okay. this is a study that a couple of uh, PhD students did uh, looking mm. at how the number of transistors on a chip, on a typical chip has increased year over years. And if you look at the top line, which is the number of transistors, 
we can see it is a it is a direct logarithmic curve it has been increasing drastically since 1970 to 2010 we have gone from a couple of thousands of transistors to bil uh, billions of transistors. Today, NVIDIA has like 19 billion of 19 billion transistors on their GPU. Right. By the way, chip. I just want to uh, kind of reiterate one of the statements that you made. You mentioned that this is like a logarithmic curve. What I want to mention is the scale is logarithmic, but the curve itself, yeah. even though it looks straight, is actually exponential. Right? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rajat. Oh, so the transistors kept on increasing, but there was a very interesting point that came around where suddenly the performance was not increasing as fast as the transistors were increasing. And when we say single threaded uh, performance means we have a single processing unit mm -hmm. whose performance uh, and we measure its performance. And what we noted that we were not able to make a big core much more big mm -hmm. and get much more performance out right. of it. And we were not able to scale the frequency as well that high right? because it was uh, leading to yield errors, etc. Mm -hmm. So we need to stabilize. So what designers came up is, okay, we cannot make a single core very big. What if we put multiple cores like that over there? And that's where all the concept of multi, uh, multi core programming, uh, multi core came into existence and designers instead of focusing on increasing a single threaded performance, started focusing on how we can have multiple cores in it, how we can parallelize the workload so that we can get better performance out of it. Right, right. And that's one of the pinnacle why your computer systems are so powerful today. If we would have gone in the direction of pursuing only single threaded performance, we would have been stuck long back. Right. right. Okay, so moving on, do you want to make comments on the power and performance? So these are these three things are very interesting. So these three things are these three topics: power, performance, and cost are the pinnacle of for all the constraints that come into embedded systems. And mm -hmm. I again take the example of Alexa because it's such a wide range, right? You have Alexa Dot, you have Alexa Mini, you have Alexa Touch, you have multiple kinds of Alexa which are doing exactly the same thing but they cost very different right right because one can perform better than other so you can you can put a better performance chip over there but with that better performance come more power and cost right okay so the the whole industry of semiconductor is finding a trade-off between all of them mm. and you can take the mobile industry right mobile industry started Till mobile industry, everybody was considered about performance. They wanted to just increase performance, performance, performance. And then the concept of mobile came along where now you have to run the same device for hours on a single battery. Mm. You are no longer connected to a wall supply and you wanted power as a factor. What that led to, even though systems were very fast, mobile systems were not as fast as laptops right, at that right. time. So they reduced the performance. Right. You know, let me also maybe add to what you're saying. So. I want to give away like the relation between the three in terms of how you, you know, you cannot optimize all of them. So we have to understand this, that, you know, obviously the devices are made out of transistors. And so the more number of these, you know, you have, the more area they will occupy first off also to, you know, make each one of them operate. You're going to obviously give more power, right? Yes. And so more power. Also, you wanted more transistors because you wanted more performance. Yes. But the reason you have more transistors is because you wanted performance. And the moment performance went up, you know, the power went up. And now because of the number of transistors and the area, the cost also went up. Right. So these are, yes. you cannot make a device that is, well, not that you cannot make. It's very hard to make a device that is cheap performs a lot and is low on power. It's very difficult, right? Because if you want to stretch yeah. the performance, the power and the cost numbers go up automatically. Yeah. Yes. So the thing was, so you have that embedded, embedded processing element over there, right? And now we know the constraints hmm. that we have, right? which is the performance power. And so over time, what we realize is we can achieve the same thing with different kind of components. Right. So based on the cost, power and performance, 
the there are multiple solutions how you can come up with that embed system uh, that embed processing element right one of them is a6 so what a6 means is application specified integrated circuits so what it means is i have hard coded all my logics into the hardware mm -hmm. which cannot be reprogrammed or changed in the feed mm -hmm. and it can do precisely what you told me it can do okay. it should right. do so the benefit of this approach is since there is no reconfigurability there is a lot of optimization you can do during design etc and that's why the cost is less because you can manufacture them in millions and uh, they are it's easy to manufacture them they are small die size you don't need to put extra components in it so cost is less mm. since there are less transistors power is less and since everything is hard coded there is nothing uh, dynamic decisions it is making everything is hard coded and paths are fixed mm -hmm. the performance is the highest that you can get right but now everything is hard coded what if you find a bug what if now you want to fix it right apparently you cannot fix it because everything is hard coded all you have to do is you have to respin a chip right. that can come right. out and you know i just want to extend your statement here when you mention hard coded what that really what people should really imagine is like all the transistors are you know connected together to perform one single function yes right and the point is in this one single function if you figure out few transistors are co connected like incorrectly yeah that's all you're done you know now the bug yeah. fix in that at that hardware level is is going to cost you a lot more so to solve this problem uh, designers added some kind of uh, programmability to the such kind of asics and that's when that's when feed programmable gate arrays were formed mm. and now you can rewire uh, not rewire so fpgas are formed up with a lot of what called a lookup tables where you can based on the selection you can select some formula that will come out right and this can be reprogrammed that means you can reprogram these lookup tables to do something different right but now you need much more components to do that because now you want uh, that my hardware can be changed in the field as i want there's a lot of hardware redundant hardware that you put over there that should not be there when compared to ac right and that's why the cost is very high yeah. the power consumption is high but the but hmm. still things are happening in hardware there is no software involved over right. there so the performance is still significantly high and the bug fix cost is low because all you have to do is you can do a over there a upgrade and now you have a different hardware right. so where do people use it people use it in accelerators network routers where sudden where every year you know there is a some algorithmic updates routing uh, routing upgrades that you can right. do but these networks are so high tense that you can you don't want uh, hard software intervention much okay. over there you want to do majority of things in hardware okay. and switching should be fast right. so fpgas are good right. over there you know one example of where fpgas are used uh, around people is in their cars not not all of the cars mostly you know in cars and uh, in the set top boxes so this is typically to deploy hardware based uh, you know filters uh, digital signal processing units so your incoming signals from the satellite get filtered little better if they decide that they want to improve yes. then they can you know on the air over the air update the hardware by reconnecting yeah. and i should also mention fpgas can be imagined to be lego blocks that you know you can deploy yeah. a, uh, a design on and they reconfigure themselves to become that hardware right and in in yeah. car also they are used for uh, image processing the rear view camera for example uh, that's an example uh, okay go ahead so the general trend is that uh, a lot of fields start using fpgas and once they have figured out what's their final applications they switch to a6 kind right. of thing that save them a lot of right cost. and it avoids this possibility of you know bugs right yes yes so and so there is a middle ground as well where and that middle ground is called programmable hardware mm -hmm. somehow if we can tell our hardware what to do and change its behavior mm -hmm. with some latency mm -hmm. that should fix our problems as well right so 
what you do is now you put something that can be programmed you put something that can understand some kind of instructions some and you can give it to instructions and it changes the paths of the hardware for you not the hardware the hardware is already there it just changes the flow how data and control flow in that right hardware. so let me put it this way so you have like a state machine that can you know read some part some instructions somewhere and then you know act in certain way and yes. th th those instructions we are seeing are the program right yes okay. so uh they are uh, actually all of them are one but usually people like to categorize into two uh, two terms mm -hmm. uh so these are specifically microcontrollers and processors and these are basically categorized based on their pop, uh, power and performance measures okay so microcontrollers are used for small embedded applications where uh, you care a lot about cost mm -hmm. and uh, you care a lot about uh, and your application is not that extensive that you need a very high end processing right. though microcontrollers are becoming very performant day mm -hmm. by day that's nothing to say and the major the real major difference between them and processors is only the real time response where microcontrollers are still designed with re real time processing in mind and processors can handle some kind of latency but overall the thing is with this even though you take a bit of a toll on performance mm -hmm. your bug fix cost is still very low and your power consumption is low because you still don't put very much redundant hardware in your chip right right well again you know just jumping in and adding one more point which is a microcontroller uh, is usually you know a microprocessor surrounded by peripherals and as rajit mentioned you know this 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 comes as a package the reason to that is latencies right and then the other thing is this processor here is kind of um, you know tailor made for low low cost and low power uh, or medium power yeah. right a generic microprocessor uh, would yeah. be like you know hungry and much more power hungry and much more capable so yeah. Yeah, so this is a this is a thing of nineties actually. Nowadays, nobody makes a standalone mm. microprocessor. Mm. Everybody makes something called a SOC, which is system on chip, where things are already connected to the processor you want to operate with. Right. And again, and microcontrollers were system on chip, but now people since the category has been made, people still keep using right. that category. But overall, you can categorize everything as a on system chip, right. on chip. Yeah. Fair. So. Microcontroller typically runs these safe autos and then free autos kind of software, right? Right. Am I yes. Right? Okay. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, yes, it can actually run whatever you want. <laughs> it can okay. run Linux as well. But it doesn't make sense. If it, wants, it doesn't make sense. They were not built to yeah. do that. But I yeah. suppose the idea is that microcontrollers are like programmable. Um, single application right? they're like focused right. for single your oven for example yes. right? does very specific thing heat things up right and then you have certain mm -hmm. control which is like you know change the timer and select menu and all of that but its application is very restricted it's like heat things up take some inputs heat things up so for those kind of things microcontrollers are best you know okay also, it has that uh, display kind, of, right? Like mm. micro uh, wave would have a display, a, timer yeah. display, something like display. that. Yes. So to drive so, all of so this mm. would do some processing and then do the display. Yes. Thing, yes. Right? Yeah. But the idea of microcontrollers is it it is typically supposed to implement a software based state machine, which is very tiny. And for that, yeah. you would yeah. kind of use something like free artos or safe artos. It makes sense. Um, but again, you can, if you would want, run Linux after you know a lot of judo. Uh, but that's <laughs> let's say don't do it. <laughs> yeah, fair. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so well, like that's in, why I keep coming. Of, yes, yes, there. So, in in terms of supporting the instructions, are those the processor and microcontroller are same? Is is that correct? They see that's why I keep coming back to the fact that uh, you know this is a terminology of old. Everything is called system on chip today. Micro, uh, 
a microprocessor doesn't mean only Intel processor. They are microprocessors sitting in your uh, car's dashboard. Your infotainment system is run by that. And that is very application specific, not very generic uh, system, which you can do to do whatever you want. So it's all comes back to system on chip. Uh, you can make a microcontroller using a processor, but that's what I said, right? Now the real distinction that has left between microcontroller and microprocessor is all about real time latency. How real time are you? How much is your interrupt latency? So microcontrollers even today are designed with a mind that the interrupt latency should be very less while microprocessors still are designed or microprocessors or I don't know what to call it now. Uh, are still designed <laughs> with uh, that latency is not a not a problem. Well, Performance is a major problem. Going back to Dave's original question, which is, can they both run the same set of instructions? In case of ARM, uh, I think between the M class con controllers and the A class processors, right? Both of them do share, you know, some part of their instruction set architecture is same so you cannot take a code for let's say m class controller and directly run it like the compiled code you cannot directly run it on a class cpus mm -hmm. few of the instructions are different um so yeah most of the instruction set would be similar but there would be those few instructions that are different you know that would not let you run the process uh the program as is let's say well, when I say program again, you know, the compiled yeah. final binary that you will need to recompile for both the processors. Yeah. Go ahead. Now, should okay. we talk about processor and our system okay. on chip? So, yeah. So the question comes as, yeah. So the question comes as we talked about that we need a programmable system that can change the, that is kind of a, that can execute a state machine and alternate the behavior as we want but how do we design such a processor what are the basic needs to design such a processor so in somewhere in 1940s or 1950s uh, von Neumann ca came up with a very basic model if you want such a pro so he came up with a problem set that if you want a minimal reprogrammable system what you need is three com at least three components one is the memory where you can store the program or instructions that should be executed or the state machine that should be executed. A compute unit that can execute that, that can iterate over that and some peripherals or interconnect that you can use to connect to the real world. And even today, uh, that's this is 1940s, even today, even though we have uh, improved a lot on this model, but if you try to abstract a lot of details out, a lot of st systems still work on the basic von Neumann model, which is a compute, a memory, and an interconnect. Not to say today com architectures are much more complex. We have improved upon this model a lot, specifically for right. higher performance, etc. But right. still, the basic remains the same. Oh yeah, sure. So Fish, you want to add more let on me spe speak a little more to this. So what we see <laughs> on the screen here is well, essentially the same storage peripherals to talk to the you know real world. And not only, I mean, we are showing here like the output path, like an LED blinking, but there can also be an input path, right? Uh, and we can skip that for now. But uh, I suppose I want to talk specifically about this compute unit. So one can imagine that this compute unit has like the ALU, which does uh, you know, the mathematics or which does the actual computation. Then there is a control unit, which does all the orchestration as to where the data is coming from, how the ALU should consume it and so on and so forth. And then internal to the CPU, we have something called fast memory or registers. Uh, it's called registers, the register file. Uh, but you can imagine it to be local fast memory. And then the idea is from the storage, you know, the CPU will float some address. The storage will give it the data. The data goes to the registers. The ALU operates on the registers, puts the answer back in registers. And that answer can then be stored back into the memory as well. Right. So that is like a model of the CPU or a system that people can, you know, um, uh, keep handy, so to speak, a mental model. Raj, do you want to add to this or did I cover all of the ground? 
yeah okay right so but now the thing is do you, should you be you know aware of all of the details of a cpu and this and that so idea to that is the answer to that is a no and Rajat, do you want to you know cover the ground here Yeah, so I would just uh, say this, okay, so a CPU is yeah. a lot of uh, transistors, right? Now, if designer, uh, right. now, how do you control those transistors? Now, if you start knowing the details of each and every transistors, what will happen is once the CPU improves, hmm. your code is, of, is no more meaningful. And now hmm. you have a problem of backward compatibility. How do you be backward compatible and still evolve a system downstairs? So I like to think of it as a, as a very software. And if you, even if you look at a software centric model, how do you do that? And mm -hmm. that's what operating system does, right? They provide you an interface called a system, mm -hmm. system library, syscall library. And it says, as long as you respect this library, I guarantee you this operation will be done. You should not be aware what I, uh, whether I'm right. running. Kind of as long as you, know, you call the functions that the library has exposed your program will work even if the underlying library yeah. implementation changes the function call like as long as the function name remains same you're good yeah yeah so what it means is now you can have any kind of print statement that print statement come can come from python can come from rust can come from c can come from anyone as long as it respects that abstraction right. it is going to get printed on the display and this abstraction is very important because this abstraction is what has led to the evolution of hardware so mm -hmm. so magnificently. And we are able to develop so many languages right. just by respecting such abstractions. So hardware designers also follow some such kind of abstraction. And that's where they say, as long as you respect this abstraction, we don't care right. whether you're running right. Linux on us or a window on us. Right. It is going to work fine. And the best mm -hmm. example of this is the automotive industry. If you look at of the automotive industry, irrespective of which car you drive, as long as you know how to control clutch, brake, accelerator, and gearing system right. and steering system, you can drive that car. Now, under under uh, underneath the engine can come from BMW, can come from Mercedes, right. so can the... come from Hyundai. You should not care what right. kind of suspension you know, system it has. You should not and care. Just to kind of reiterate, should all these are like the abstraction that you know the car is built on top of. The underlying implementation and details of a car might change, but if you use these abstraction correctly, and by the way, you know, on, you only have to use these abstractions, the gear, the clutch, the brake, the accelerator, and the steering wheel correctly. And, you know, you can always drive a car. Well, I would want to come back to this diagram here because we spoke about abstraction. So what Rajat was mentioning is that there is this hardware world on which the software runs right but then the thing is if the hardware changes the software will need to change and then the abstraction that rajit was pointing to is this part which is all the cpu designers mm. give away something called instruction set architecture a bunch of instructions that if the software is made out of will always run on the cpu and then the CPU can be, you know, improved in the next generation. For example, we have various versions of the Intel CPUs, you know, Ice Lake, Comet Lake, whatnot. And the same binary, the same application always runs on each of the CPUs. That's because the implementation is different, but the ISA is same, right? The ISA can extend, you know, you can offer more instructions, but if you're software is using you know the common subset it will always run on the previous cpus as well right so that's the idea of abstraction and why it is important yes and this idea of abstraction by the way uh, gives freedom to the hardware guys to drive their own progress while the soft software guys can continue to you know innovate in the software world and write their software without thinking that they'll need to rewrite it ever just to run it on a newer processor so that's the idea of uh, abstraction then using the ISA, the instruction set architecture. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And I think with that, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Dave. So, so Piyush, can you also a little bit talk about uh, 
Oh software yes, yes. To that... hardware contract, like the yes. hardware software, software contract, and then the hardware Sorry. software contract to the hardware. Oh, I see. Okay, like okay. How they inter- so first of that contract itself is called the ISA. So this hardware software contract is the ISA, and the way it works is like this, right? So we somewhere talked about state machine, right? Um, right. So we talked about state machine. So your CPU is a state machine and it changes its state by reading memory. So it reads memory, you know, there is something here, it fetches it in, looks at it and decides to do something, right? So that's the idea of state machine changing its state. The idea is what goes in this memory is dictated by ISA. Right. So, for example, do you want to add two numbers? Then there would yes. be an instruction called, let's say, add R, well, R8 to R7 and R6. So, idea then is that what we were seeing here, it's more like, okay, take R8, take, sorry, take R7, take R6 and put the answer back in R8. But this instruction, right, this, 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 uh, what do you say, um, this command, so to speak, is dictated by ISA. And then what ISA does is, uh, well, this is like English looking form of, you know, an instruction, but this actually translates to ones and zeros in the memory. Now, what, what your original question was, was around the abstraction and the contract. Now, the thing is, as long as you write your program using instructions or encodings given in the ISA, this program need not change. But the CPU implementing the same ISA can improve, meaning you can change the number of transistors here, make it low power, make it smaller, make it faster, all of that. And this program will still run. What that means then, what the connotations of that is, the software guys can continue to assume that this program will always work this library will always work and build more libraries on top, right? So there is never a point using the same, let's say x86 CPUs, future generations of the same x86 CPU. There will never be a point where you say, hey, oops, you know, my program is breaking because the CPU changed, right? So that way you, the software guys can continue to drive their progress very hard while the hardware engineers can continue to make the same family of processors much faster and better right yeah so that's the idea yeah so so i guess uh Piyush has a yeah. very good video yeah. on isa separately can link recorded that. out on it yeah yeah where we can yeah. add a link of and i suppose you know with we can this, link that go ahead go ahead yeah. dave i think you have another question <laughs> So this this ISA is typically hmm. represented by two chains. Right? Yeah, that's Whenever a good one. Whenever something new ISA comes in, comes right? In, so your compiler, for example, let's say, I mean, different languages do it differently. We'll talk about compiled languages. Hmm. Let's say we take C. So you write code in C, you give that to compiler, and then this compiler, hmm. if you're natively compiling, it would know what CPU you are compiling for. But if not, then you also provide it the CPU or ISA specification, you hint as to what ISA you want to compile with. And then this compiler will output a binary, which is zeros and ones, which are compliant with this ISA, right? So if you mentioned x86, it will compile for x86. If you give ARM, it will compile for ARM. But now once this binary is available for a certain ISA, it will run on all the CPUs that support that ISA. That's the idea, right? And these CPUs can be like, you know, first generation, second generation, so on and so forth. But the key is they have to support the same ISA. If they support a different ISA, game over. You got to, you know, compile for that CPU again, but your software need not change. Yeah. And I think uh, here the tool yes. channel also provides some sort of abstraction, right? Uh, the C code that you write hmm. is the same, but you have uh, provide you provide different yes. tool channels. Yes, so depending on what options you ISAs, give, it right? so, compiles okay. for different uh, ISAs. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Let's let's yeah. put a hard break. We don't yeah, want sure. to cover the complete course in today itself. We are, <laughs> we will we will we will start with the assembly language, and we will cover the high level high high yeah. level languages and the tool chains in the series. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> it's a good sneak peek. It's a good learning. Yeah. But let's so hold with hold this. Our maybe you know, we planned that. on <laughs> yeah. doing this in fifteen minutes, and here we are yeah. in forty minutes. <laughs> So let's let's close this uh, video for today and let's yes. continue in the next one. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you.